History and Philosophies of the Jamaica Labour Party, Part 2. Welcome to the sixth in a series of news magazine podcasts, Get the Facts. Building, an Independent Jamaica. This chapter serves to highlight the Jamaica Labour Party performance, or the lack thereof during the decade which immediately follows independence, and how that organization took the nation on a path of despair, destruction, hopelessness and tribalism. Government 1960s Reign of Terror. Early 1962, independent inauguration and celebrations are now out of the way, it is time to build Jamaica. As stated in Part 1, the electorate has given the very feeble 78-year-old Sir Alexander Bustamante with little or no academic achievements along with his Jamaica Labour Party the mandate to build the new nation. The back wall renewal overdue. Just as Dr. Portia Lucretia, Mama P. Simpson Miller did in recent years when she approached China's President Xi Jinping, asking for financial assistance to build a new children's adolescence hospital in western Jamaica, it was so unfortunate that the grant did not come through until there was a change of government, so the Jamaica Labour Party was expected to spearhead that project. Similarly, Norman Washington Manley back in 1961 while he was Premier had approached then-President of the United States of America John F. Kennedy for financial assistance in the renewal of a shantytown called, Bacco Wall, or, Dungal, located in western Kingston. As faith would have it, that grant came through two years later, one year after the Jamaica Labour Party returned to power. The birth of Dons and Tribal War. In the years following independence a lack of economic rejuvenation brought with it growing despondency among the masses and increased tension between JLP and PNP supporters. Edward C. Haaga, ex-music producer, then current Minister of Housing and Development for the ruling JLP, and future Prime Minister. In order to make way for a new housing development, Siha Aga, a Harvard-trained anthropologist ordered the clearing of the slum, squatter, shantytown area known as Bacco Wall, or Dungal, in his own parliamentary district in West Kingston. Violence erupted as residents refused to leave and Siha Aga decided to call upon local gang members to act as enforcers. First instance of gerrymandering. After chasing away the inhabitants of Bacco Wall in 1966, and as general elections approached, residency of the new Tivoli Gardens was then given to Die Hard, JLP supporters drawn from all over the island, thus securing Edward C. Haaga's re-election in the upcoming elections. It is said that Lester Lloyd, Jim Brown, Coke has his roots in St. Elizabeth, while, Shoa Howie, ancestors are from Westmoreland. Zaki the High Priest. Jamaica's first Don was appointed to be Tivoli Gardens' overall enforcer, as a result, Zaki Pathway, in the community was named in his honor. The corrupt manner in which Si Haaga issued the homes in his model community, has given birth to a new phenomenon, his reckless actions have led to the beginning of tribal war, rarely had gerrymandering been so ruthless and with this one move Si Haaga had legitimized the gangs. This is where the hatred began. Residents fleeing the Bacco Wall Tivoli Gardens crusade ended up in communities as far east as Taylor Lands in Bull Bay St. Andrew and westerly communities such as Windsor Heights, Big and Little Lane in Central Village, as well as March Penn Road and Spanish Town, St. Catherine. A lot of families took refuge in other places such as Warica Hills, Moonlight City, Burger and McGregor Gully, Rockfort, Rennick Lodge, Dunkirk, Parade and Rose Gardens, Admiral, Allman, Franklin, Greenwich, Jones, Trench and Whitfield Towns, Payne. Land, back to, Cockburn Pen, and Riverton City etc. Those running away from Belgium and Lizard Town on the southeastern tip of Tivoli Gardens, ended up in places like Hannah Town and the Matthews Lane, Rose Lane, West Street areas, this is why it is widely believed that a lot of persons in these communities have blood relatives in Tivoli Gardens. Soon every district in Kingston and St. Andrew was divided into either JLP or PNP supporters, controlled by a local gang who gave their affiliation. Graffiti along the lines of, you are now entering a, JLP zone, remains the norm in Kingston. The optimism of emancipation was long gone by the time the Ethiopians sang, everything crash, describing the strikes, gang warfare and state of emergency that followed Tivoli Gardens. Present-day gerrymandering cases. Presently there are similar operations taking place in the Gregory Park community of Portmore, St. Catherine and in Parade and Rose Gardens in central Kingston. Residents' homes in these communities are being firebombed, causing them to flee so the sitting MPs can consolidate by creating safe seats for future re-elections. Second time external involvement. The rivalry between the various politically aligned gangs was also fueled from outside. By the time of the 1967 elections came around the CIA, worried that Manley's socialist views would encourage another Cuba, was supplying Bustamante supporters with guns. 
Manley, in turn, had asked for help from Russia and Cuba. Henchmen became as much a part of political life as the ballot paper. Add to all this the burgeoning drug trade that was beginning in Kingston and you have a snapshot of the major problems still facing Jamaica today. A brief history of Tivoli Gardens. Developed in a renewal project between 1963 and 1965, the neighborhood continued to suffer from poverty. By the late 20th century, it had become a haven for drug trafficking activities and social unrest. Repeated confrontations took place between law enforcement officers and criminal gunmen in 1992, 1996, 1997, 2001, 2005, 2008, and 2010. The latest was associated with a manhunt for their strongman Christopher Michael Koch aka Dudas, a drug crime boss, and head of the show A Posse. He was extradited to the USA on drug trafficking charges after being captured. Carol Gardens and Sir Alexander Bustamante J. Elp's hatred for Rasta. April 11, 1963. Bring in all Rastas dead or alive, Carolyn Cooper, contributor. Those are the infamous words of Sir Alexander Bustamante, national hero and first prime minister of independent Jamaica. Bustamante's turn of phrase comes straight out of the Wild West, wanted dead or alive. Bustamante apparently conceived all Rastafarians as outlaws in a Hollywood western who had to be exterminated by any means necessary. Issuing a death sentence, Bustamante literally turned all Rastafarians into villains. Rastafarians had to flee when they see the police, because if caught they may be trimmed with broken glass bottles. Guilty or innocent, they could no longer expect to enjoy the protection of the law. All Rastafarians were completely demonized and became victims of comprehensive state brutality. How did this come about? Over half a century ago, at about 4 a.m. on, Holy, Thursday, six bearded men set fire to a gas station in Coral Gardens. They were armed with machetes, guns, bows and arrows. I suppose it was cowboys and Indians, jamrock style. The leader was Rudolph, Franco, Franklin, who had a big grievance against the owner of the gas station, Ken Douglas. Franklin and several other bearded men had long been squatting on land in Coral Gardens. They lived in relative peace until the land was sold to Douglas. Naturally, the new owner asserted his right to the property and attempted to drive the squatters off the land. As is often the case, the squatters refused to budge. During one of several attempts at eviction, Franklin was shot by the police. He survived but was told by a medical doctor that he would die sooner rather than later from a bullet lodged in his body. Determined to take revenge on his assailants, Franklin sought allies to launch his counterattack. Dreadlocks and comb some. At the time, there were two groups of Rastafarians living in Montego Bay, the Dreadlocks and the Comb Sum. The Dreadlocks lived on Railway Lane and the Comb Sum squatted in Coral Gardens. Franklin irrationally proposed that both groups of Rasta join forces to burn down Montego Bay. The Dreadlocks rejected the scheme on the basis that Rasta defend, peace and love. Franklin, who seemed to subscribe to the philosophy, I don't give a damn, I done dead already, pressed along with his plans. Instead of burning down all of Montego Bay, he settled for Douglas's gas station, an obviously flammable target. On the morning of the attack, there was only one attendant at the station, Mr. George Plummer, who fled for his life to the nearby Edgewater Inn Motel. He, clearly, had no shares in the company. A Mr. Marsh, who was at the motel, foolishly ventured out to investigate the matter. In a most unfortunate turn of affairs, he was murdered. By midday, seven others lost their lives, including Franklin. According to a Gleaner report published on April 13, 1963, the Montego Bay Fire Brigade had responded to the fire alert at 4.53 a.m. from the house of Dr. Carol DeLisser. The blaze at the gas station was brought under control after 5 a.m. led by Sup Sidney Burke, who joined the police squad that rushed up from Montego Bay under Inspector Fisher. Five vehicles, including two civilians, started into the hills after the Rastafarian gang. Among those chasing the gang was Mr. Coswell, who was on his way to Kingston but decided to give some help to the chase. They drove through two miles of rough terrain from the ruins of Rose Hall Great House. The search party ran into the gang or rather ran into an ambush. The bearded men attacked from an overhanging cliff above. In the fight which ensued, two members of the gang were shot to death and Corporal Melbourne and Mr. Coswell were cut down. By then, it was discovered later that Hedman Fowler had been already cut down about a mile from his home on Trial Farm. The day's gruesome events became known as, the Coral Gardens Incident. But this was much more than an isolated, incident. Franklin's murderous rampage was a sign of the fundamental inequities of Jamaican society. 
Landlessness is a recurring a problem which has never been properly addressed by successive pre- and post-independence governments. The response of Bustamante's government to the terrible actions of six bearded men was brutally excessive. Bring in all Rasta, dead or alive. Why should all Rastafarians be exterminated because of the actions of six men, especially since the ringleader had already been killed? Bustamante's irrational call signified much more than a need to restore the peace. The Coral Gardens incident was a chilling episode in a long history of state violence against Rastafari. JLP land controversy continues. Present Jamaica Labour Party regime have been working feverishly to control all lands, beachfront, commercial and otherwise, there was the Hollywell issue with Daryl Vaz, Andrew Holness with the Bob Marley, and other beaches plus White River tourist attractions. Houses in Clifton were bulldozed, while Jawita's Vale and residents in Westmoreland were all issued with eviction notice. Bustamante sick and bedridden. As the years go by Bustamante was becoming less able to continue. Leading, so Sir Donald Burns Sangster based on seniority was easily the, heir to the JLP throne, to take up the mantle of the party and government, but clearly Sir Alex weren't happy with him leading his beloved Jamaica Labour Party so he held on to party leadership from his sick bed. Following the victory of the JLP in the general election on February 21, 1967, and the resignation of Sir Alexander Bustamante, Sir Donald was appointed Prime Minister on February 22, 1967 while simultaneously retaining the posts of Minister of Finance and Minister of Defence. As Prime Minister, he had completed forming his cabinet and had only attended one session of Parliament before he suddenly became ill and was sent to Canada for specialist treatment. Sir Donald succumbed to his illness and passed away on April 11, 1967. Four days before he died, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. His mysterious illness it is said, was a case of food poisoning and the usual suspect is believed to be the mastermind. On his passing, Mr. Hugh Lawson Shearer was chosen to be Prime Minister of Jamaica. He was sworn in on April 11, 1967. On January 6, 1969 Mr. Shearer was appointed by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II as member of the Privy Council of England. Shearer served as Prime Minister until the JLP term ended on February 29, 1972. School program funds stolen. During his time as Premier, as a part of his post-independent plan of empowering the youths through education, and to facilitate the development of the nation, in an effort to create high school spaces, Norman Washington Manley set about sourcing funding for a school building program. These funding came through midway the JLP time in power, lo and behold the loan which was poorly managed went missing with fewer than a quarter of the schools that were planned to be built actually built and leaving a few of them unfinished. The former Minister of State in the Ministry of Education Dr. Arthur Burt may well have been the third to face the courts and be sentenced for his role in the corrupt handling of the school building program 1967-1971 financed by the World Bank. A report from the Commission of Enquiry established to probe the matter stated that, although suggestions of a grave character were made before the commission involving Dr. Burt, he fled the island to avoid appearing before the commission and facing criminal charges, he ran away to the USA never to return. Absent from own his funeral. Dr. Burt died in the United States of America, and just as it was with Edward C. Haaga in recent times, Dr. Burt funeral service was held in Jamaica while his body was interned in the United States, this according to reliable historians, something strange about these JLP occults. Boasting about building schools. The JLP strategy of boasting about building schools is a blatantly deceptive and deceitful way of fooling the people as if to say that they care. Their trolls boastfully claim that they built 185 schools in the 1960s, but that's it. If you want to know what the problems are, just ask them to name five of those schools. I got a list of schools from a party insider, one you'd call a propagandist, on that list are schools like Calabar, Kingston College, Jamaica College, Woolmer's Boys and Girls, Immaculate Conception and a host of other schools that were built either during slavery or colonial times, long before the Jamaica Labour Party dreamed of existing. He also have on his list. Campion College, Camperdown High, Glenmuir High, Meadowbrook High, St. Andrew Technical High, St. Elizabeth Technical High, Beer Technical High, Vauxhall High among others. These are schools that were built deep into Premier Manley's second term of office between 1957 and 1962. Sometimes I have to ask myself, why the Jamaica Labour Party dislike education so much? For videos, please visit and subscribe to the TikTok Shamar underscore L underscore Sharma on the Facebook, Instagram and YouTube channels of the one Jack Ulrich Horner. Capitalists show a posse fake prosperity keep standing in the way of Jamaica and progress.
The comments expressed in this article are solely those of yours truly and not those of the People's National Party.